Hey everyone, I tried to film this video earlier and my camera battery died. So it's later and now the light is going. We're battling the autumn winter filming lights. So let's just call this cozy instead of orange, which I'm sure looking at the camera is what it probably is. Um, I took an unintentional break from YouTube last week, though I think that all of us between us had enough media to consume with the US election going on, which made last week feel like it was about five years long. Um, but regardless, I'm sorry that I wasn't uploading content on here. Um, so today I wanted to sit down and kind of just have a catch up. So we're just having a, a cozy time today. So maybe the orange lighting is good. I don't know. So as I said, last week I wasn't expecting to not be around. I knew that I was going to be really busy last week and this week in particular because I'm on book deadline at the moment. My deadline is the end of this week and I have been very busy obviously for the past several months this year with this book but it always ramp ramps up towards deadline time. I mean this is book number 10 for me you would think that that wouldn't be the case now but it's just it's how it seems to work it's quite exciting in a way getting close to a deadline I, I do like that um, but I had still planned to film videos but last week um, and if you follow me on Instagram you already know this I hate saying that if you follow me elsewhere online but it, it is true if you follow me on Instagram you will already know part of what I'm gonna say a couple of weeks ago Warner Brothers released their new version of The Witches by Roald Dahl and um, I've spoken about The Witches on here before. Can you believe that it is 30 years since the first film came out? It was 1990, it's 30 years ago, that made me feel quite old. I have a, a complicated relationship with The Witches. I loved the book as a child, I loved it, but I, I really saw myself as the villain in that book. Like I didn't think I was a bad person, but I identified with the witches. They have um, no toes, so they have square feet, they are missing hair, they have claw-like hands. Um, so that was always really, it was a strange relationship that I had with that book and with the other media that I grew up with where the disfigurement equals villainy trope was used it was everywhere so it was a, a strange thing to encounter again and again and the book also which I realise now and I didn't know when I was a young child reading it is is very anti-semitic as well um so there it's a complicated book but it came out um, this new film with Anne Hathaway two weeks ago I think and I was getting lots of messages about it online and I didn't know why at first because as I said I've already spoken about the witches but then I saw a video that Warner Brothers and Anne Hathaway had shared on Instagram it was a promo video where they were encouraging children to hunt for witches in real life to, to look for them because hashtag witches are real and they listed the things that children should be looking for and it was um, people who didn't have proper hands they had missing fingers and so they wore gloves um they didn't have hair so they wore wigs they were missing toes and they have a heightened sense of smell which i also happen to have you know people with easy have a heightened sense of smell anyway so then i realized why everyone was messaging me because they had changed the film and they had given the witches ectrodactyly which is what i have missing fingers and i thought uh, okay we've taken it to another level this time. So I did post about this on Instagram, um, sharing my thoughts, resources, about why it's not just an issue with this film. And I wasn't calling for a boycott of the film. I just wanted to generate a conversation. I wanted parents to talk about this with their kids really, so that it didn't leak out into the playground as much because it was going to. And it wasn't just for children either. I mean, I do really feel for kids especially with limb differences, but for the adults out there too, who are tired and exhausted, um, I stand with you. So I had posted about it on uh, Instagram and it talked about the, the wider picture, um, which as you know, I've spoken about on here before and I'll link uh, videos in the description box down below if, if you happen to be new here. The post went viral. It's an odd feeling when that happens because you want to reach people who don't already have awareness of this topic because that's kind of the point but also when you go viral you reach so many people who don't care about who you are at all or what you have to say and who have already made their mind up about who you are and what they want to say to you um so last week i spent most of last week on the phone to journalists who were calling me asking me to explain the history of the disfigurement and villainy tropes so that they could write an article about it and i hasten to say it wasn't just me who was talking about this lots of people with limb differences were raising awareness of this on social media 
but it, it, it went everywhere in all all of the papers and I as I said spent a long time talking to journalists but also writing articles myself and going on the radio to speak about why this is a conversation that we need to have and, and why it's important I mean this is a conversation that's been going on so long in the film industry it is a recognized issue changing faces who are a great charity a couple of years ago set up the I am not your villain campaign highlighting how prevalent it was to have villains who are shown to the audience as bad because of the way they look every James Bond villain most horror films lots of Disney villains comic book villains so anyway that is what I spent a lot of my week doing last week I will link some articles that I wrote in the description box down below I will link some radio interviews that I did as well but the thing that I found particularly exhausting is that because it was shared so widely my Instagram post was on Sky News I wasn't there and I wasn't there to give context to it or to give more information they had just used my post which they're allowed to do because it's public but it then meant that hundreds of people flooded to my page and I got so many horrible messages I deleted a lot of it the stuff that was pure hate you know the stuff that was just all block capitals of course people hate people like you or think that you're terrifying because you are terrifying people saying i can't believe that you go into schools i see that you're an author you should stay away from children because you will scare them like the stuff that basically just proves my point um but because a lot of the world right now is as we know so divided and people don't listen to each other. I did want to try and take the time to speak to people who found me and who were, yes, being aggressive and shouting at me, but who weren't just spouting pure hate. People who maybe, if they were given extra context, might think about it some more. So I spent a lot of energy doing that last week. And some people might think that that's ridiculous, and I understand that too. Um, so at some points I thought I was being ridiculous, but if we don't communicate, if we don't try and learn, I don't know what will happen to us, quite frankly. And this is one of the books, actually. I pulled it off the shelf before I started filming this. I want to read this this month. It's called You're Not Listening um, by Kate Murphy. It came out last year. This is a proof copy. It says, at work, we're taught to lead the conversation. On social media, we shape our personal narratives. At parties, we talk over one another. So do our politicians. We're not listening and no one is listening to us. I think that is the most soul crushing frustrating thing and i'm not exempt from this i'm sure that i have gut reactions to certain situations where i want to cling to my feelings instead of educating myself more because it's easier um but in the situation that i'm specifically talking about last week where i would present people with actual information to show that it's not just a movie and that this is a recognized legitimate problem in the film and book industries for people to say i'm not going to read that no it's stupid it's uh I don't really know what to do with that apart from keep trying I guess I had a lot of comments from people I'm talking about this because I find it interesting and I, and I hope that you find it interesting too you can skip ahead if you don't but you know some people were saying don't you think people would like people with disabilities more if they didn't complain about this kind of stuff if you just sucked it up and got on with it just exist and be a positive person people will like you more and is that not what we all do all of the time you know i exist i hope very positively online and i make so much content about books and videos about baking and sharing my life with you guys uh, in all its forms and that also means that i can take the time to talk about those things as well but i suppose that's the point uh, when they came across that post instead of looking wider and seeing the bigger picture to them i was fulfilling the things they expect from someone with disfigurements they thought that i was angry and bitter and monstrous and that's why we have this problem <laughs> unless we talk about it we won't move forward so i'll stop talking about that now that's why i was not here last week last week i was exhausted and sad and tired um but lots of positive things came out of that too i had lots of good conversations with people anyway um i will answer some questions i asked you to send in some questions um things that you wanted to know because 
I have been absent. Okay, let's whiz through these because I feel like I've already talked for quite a long time. Oh, this is spooky lighting. Sp spooky lighting. Um, someone said, you seem to do lots of fun work projects. What have you been up to recently? Um, I know that I normally do work vlogs where I take you out and about behind the scenes at book festivals and all of that stuff. Obviously, I haven't been doing that in the past eight months. So I have been doing fun work projects, but they've just been at my desk. Um, and in the moment, it's difficult to talk about them. So I have been doing some fun things. I've been editing a lot recently, editing a lot of other people's work. I've been editing quite a few novels. I worked with a Korean film company a few weeks ago, which was very different for me and I enjoyed it a lot. They're coming over to the UK to film a documentary about UK bookshops. So I was their researcher talking to them about which bookshops they should visit, who they should interview, what the UK book industry is like. And it both warmed my soul and also made me a little bit sad to be talking about all the bookish places that I adore. I really enjoyed doing that though. I've also been doing a lot of teaching online. Um, I have a new series of writing workshops, which I'm doing at the moment. They're all sold out, but if you're interested, I run workshops one-on-one -on -one via email all year round for poetry, short stories, creative nonfiction. I'll link them down below if you wanna check them out. And last week I worked with Cardiff University for a conference they were doing, slightly ironically, on pro-social um, environments online, so friendly environments, and um, how those can be fostered in an age where there's so much division online. I mean, I think I would have had a lot more to say had that conference been after last week. I had a lot to say anyway, but I would have had a lot of a lot more add-on things. Someone asked me, what do you think of bookshop.org? So bookshop.org was set up in the States, I think earlier this year, and it's had great success over there, and they've just launched here. So they are trying to build themselves up as the place for online book shopping whilst also supporting bookshops. So 30% of every sale on that site goes to bookshops and bookshops can set up their own storefronts on there, which is quite cool. Um, I think, you know, anything that tries to do good like that is a great thing. Um, for context, Hive, which was set up several years ago, only give between five and 10% of a sale to a bookshop, whereas this is much higher. Um, so if you wanna shop online and you don't wanna communicate with a bookseller every time you're buying a book, then it's definitely a great place to go. I will say, if you're comfortable with buying from a bookseller and messaging them whenever you want to buy a book, I buy a lot of my books from Katie at Storytellers Inc. I literally just drop her a DM on Twitter and say, hi Katie, I'd like this book please. She tells me how much it is and then I ping the money to her via um, bank transfer. You can also do it via PayPal. And then the book arrives in two to three days. Also, if I want a recommendation from her, she can also give that to me as well. Bookshops, if you buy directly from them, will get about 50% of a sale. So if you can purchase with them directly, that's the best way to support bookshops. If you don't wanna communicate with someone or message a bookshop every time you wanna order a book or buy through their own individual websites, then yes, bookshop.org would be the next best place to go after that. Someone asked if I have any picture book recommendations for gift guides this year. I am gonna talk about those. Sorry, I feel like this phone is like, it's, it's, it's quite bright. Um, I am gonna talk about gift guidey stuff soon and I probably will do that sooner rather than later just because I know everyone's shopping earlier this year because we're all mostly doing it online. Um, so I will do that and I definitely have a stack of books that I would like to talk to you about that are picture book related that I may have treated myself to as a finishing this book reward, even though I haven't finished the book yet. But I think by the time I have finished, the books will arrive. So that's why I cheated and ordered them in advance. That, that, that's my reasoning. <laughs> oh, someone asked me, what are my plans for Christmas? Several people asked me that actually. Um, I, is anyone else, no offense to anyone who asked me that question, but it feels like a strange question. It feels like the emphasis on Christmas is so, so strong this year. I get that people want positive things to cling on to, but I also know so many people don't associate Christmas with happy things, so it's, it's a strange one. Um, I, I don't know is, is the answer. Well, no, I suppose is the answer. Do I have plans? I do not. Uh, it depends on what the restrictions are. Um, if we can, Mr. M and I will go and have dinner with his mum in her garden. I think that's probably 
the extent of it, I reckon. Um, my phone, you know how your phone sometimes does a time hop? I don't have that app, but it sometimes does it within Instagram and Facebook. It tells you this is what you were doing this time last year. It reminded me that I have not been home now in over a year. So the last time that I saw my family was over a year ago, and that's really strange. So strange. I was due to go and see them in March, but then of course that didn't happen. Actually, I noticed that one other question was, what was the last in-person work event that I did um, before coronavirus? And oh, it wasn't even before, but before it, it was a huge thing in the UK. And that was World Book Day, which was right at the start of March. And it feels like such a surreal event to have been the last in-person thing that I did. Um, because it was with over 2,000 children in one day. Um, and I'll insert some pictures here. Like, can you imagine right now being in a room with, with, with that many people? Like, that just seems ridiculous that I got on a train and went across the country and hung out with over 2,000 people in one day. What is that? That feels like some kind of alternate reality. It's ridiculous. And actually, to end on, I, actually, I've got one more question to answer, but to end this section on a positive note, one of the things that did make me laugh, one of the comments that made me laugh so much um, on the post about the witches was someone who said something along the lines of, why don't you channel your energy into bringing positive things into the world and talking about empathy. Um, I see that you write books like this, and then he listed lots of children's books, including Franklin's Flying Bookshop, bring tr true change to the world. Why don't you do something like that? You're pathetic. And then someone replied saying, you do know that she wrote Franklin's Flying Bookshop, right? And he deleted his comments so fast that I didn't even get the chance to take that sweet sweet screenshot. Oh, it was poetic. Anyway, final question was, what are my favourite board games? What have been seeing us through lockdown? I have been meaning to do a favourite board games video. I made one back in February, I think, which I'll link in the description box down below, but we have bought so many board games since then, and as this person said, they have been seeing us through. So I am not sure when I will do an in-depth video, or even if I will. So let me just show you briefly the games that we have been loving. This is Hanamakoji. It's a card game that you can play in five to 15 minutes. It's a strategy based game where you have to try and work out what cards are left in order to, to play to your own advantage. It's really, really beautiful as well. Battle Line has a similar concept. You are trying to line up, there are nine um, battle lines. <laughs> in front of you and you and the person opposite you are trying to line up three cards in front of each of them. Runs are the best ones that you can line up, so seven, eight, nine in the same colour. If not that, then three of the same number in different colours. But if the person plays a higher run than you on the same battle line or a higher number than you, so three nines instead of three eights, then they win that battle line and it's whoever wins the most. It's really fun and it gets very competitive and silly. King Dominoes is lighthearted fun. This is about arranging a kingdom. You're trying to slot together tiles that match each other. So like Dominoes, but instead of numbers, it's landscapes. And you get a certain number of points depending on how many of each landscape joined up you have. I really love this and this one would be great for kids. This is, um, I say kids, I love it. Everyone can love it. Uh, this is fine with two players. Battle Line and Hannah Bakoji are only two players. You can also play this with up to three or four players. Illamat is the most stunning game that we own and I bought it because Carson Ellis illustrates it. Um, I love her work. She does the most beautiful drawings. This has a tarot card feel to it and it is another card-based game. We quite like card-based games. I'll insert a picture of it here so you can see how stunning it is. You have to place cards in certain seasons um, and collect different valued cards. It, I mean, I can't explain all the rules here. I'm just holding them up as I go. I hope that's enough. Azul is a pattern-based game. So you are trying to create a mosaic and stop the other person completing their mosaic. This is for up to four players, but I think it works best as a two-player game. Patchwork, slightly like Azul, you are trying to create a patchwork. It's like Tetris, this one. I love it. 
bottles of burgundy all of these would be playing comfortably as uh, two player games this one is completing a kingdom and it's more luck than skill because you can only buy certain things depending on the roll of the dice but you can also block other people from from buying certain things if you know that that's what they need i will say I kind of hate really competitive games where you can be really horrible to each other. <laughs> so none of these are really horrible games at all. They are more friendly combat, yeah? Uh, this one is the, I think the 25th anniversary edition. Oh, that's what it looks like on the inside. There are so many pieces in that one. And then finally, if this stack is not gonna fall over, this is Quacks of Quedlinburg, which I have spoken about on here before. This one is very witch-like, you're making potions, and again, a lot of element of luck in here because you have your potions in your bag, your potion ingredients. So you're trying to pick out as many ingredients as you can to make your way around the board, but if you pick out too many of the wrong ingredients, then you will sabotage yourself. So those are our favorite games at the moment. We love them, would recommend all of them. And if you wanna see a playthrough of any of these games, Rado has a YouTube channel, which I'll link in the description box down below. We always watch his videos as a playthrough before playing board games, because do you find that reading the instructions of board games, it really only makes sense once you start playing. So it's good to see a game in action. I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about. Thank you for listening at the beginning of this video. I didn't so much want to talk about the, the witches and disfigurement trope itself in this video, just more the conversation surrounding it and why that can be very, very draining. And I appreciate that I'm choosing to put myself in that space and have those conversations. So I am putting myself in a vulnerable space, but I put myself in a vulnerable space, not to sound dramatic, but just by being a person with disfigurement out in the world. So I would, I would like to continue having these conversations in a constructive way, wherever I feel I can. Um, so thank you for listening to that. I'll be back soon talking to you about all the books that I read in October because I haven't done that yet. Um, let me know how your week is going. I'm sending you all lots of love.